Okay. So I am Susan Sticka, the Executive Director of Education Voters of Pennsylvania, and we are absolutely delighted to have everybody here today for um, this virtual rally in support of Pennsylvania's school funding lawsuit. We have people from all over the state. We're so grateful you could take your time, time out of your day to be here with us. So before we really get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping things. Um, First, if everybody can be on mute, that would be super helpful. Um, everybody other than the speakers, please put yourselves on mute. If you want to comment, please feel free to go into the comment box. We can chat away during this whole event. But please keep in mind, we have a seventh grade class from Scranton. So we have some young people who are here who will be in the chat with us. And then we also have some reporters who are on. So please make sure that um, you, when you're putting things in the chat, you're kind of keeping in mind who, is, uh, who else is in the room. Um, and we are we are super excited to have our seventh graders here with us today. Um, so, yep, make sure you put yourselves on. Yo, look at all of you, yay, seventh graders. Um, so I was asked, make sure you're on mute. Um, so we're here today because for the past six weeks, we have been hearing heartbreaking stories that have been coming out of underfunded schools during this trial testimony. We've heard about really young children having accidents in school because they have to wait in line to use a single toilet that is shared by 125 kids. We have heard about a teacher doing her best to make a concrete cinder block closet that has no ventilation into an inviting learning space for children. We've heard about a reading specialist who is trying to meet the needs of 1200 students by herself. We've seen superintendents and teachers, these individuals who have dedicated their lives to educating our children. We've seen them break down in tears on the stand underneath the weight of the responsibility that they have. Um, and then we heard from John Krill, the lawyer for Pennsylvania's top Republican Senator, uh, Senator Jake Corman, who, uh, during his testimony, he was questioning a rural superintendent and they were talking about test scores. And the rural superintendent from um, Otto Eldred School District in McKean County said, our test scores are you know, unacceptably low to indicate that they didn't have the resources they needed to be able to provide students with the quality education they needed. And then Mr. Krill comes out with this. What use would a carpenter have for biology? What use would someone on the McDonald's career track have for algebra one? So we learned that in this case, the defense, which, which are the, the Republican leaders in Harrisburg, they're not only arguing that they don't have to provide a constitutional system of education for our students. They're actually arguing that they have no obligation to ensure that students have access to any high quality education that prepares them for college or careers, because we have, we have a need in this, the Commonwealth for people to do jobs that are, are low wage jobs and why should the state bother to pay to educate them? Um, so this is what we are up against. We are up against lawmakers who would never allow their children to learn in the conditions that we are hearing about. We are up against these same lawmakers saying out loud that no child, whether who, wherever they live, and, and when we're talking about ch these children, we're talking about children who are poor, mostly, children who live in poor areas, and many children of color, um, that they just don't deserve any kind of quality of education. So that is why we are here today. That is why we need to come together um, in every corner of the state and lift our voices up together and demand much better from Harrisburg because this lawsuit is one step in the process, but nothing in Harrisburg is gonna change if we don't demand it from our lawmakers. So we need to talk to our friends and our neighbors. We need to be out in our communities and we need to take action. So I'm thrilled that you are here with us today. Um, and we have a lot of different things you can do. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amy, who is going to lead us, get us ready for our rally. And then we're gonna, we've got a slate of just amazing speakers. So thank you for being here today. Great job, Susan. Hi, everybody. For once during a group Zoom meeting, you are encouraged to unmute yourself because we are bringing the energy today. We okay. know how hard folks are working. So let's get ourselves like all riled up for this amazing rally today. We can't be there in person, but let's share our energy now. So I'm gonna say, there's no McDonald's career track. And you are gonna say, high quality ed for all. If you forget that, I just put it into the chat. <laughs> so are we ready? Woo! Is no McDonald's on track? Woo! 
this historic uh, lawsuit and this fight for fair education. So I am going to ask you all to mute yourselves again, and I'm going to turn it back to Susan Spicka, and I'll be back later for another embracing, enchanting, enlivening cheer. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. So we are going to kick off with our speakers, and um, Jennifer Hawks, who is a school board member at the William Penn School District, which is one of the plaintiff districts. Uh, Jennifer Hoff is going to start us off. And I see you right there. So Jen, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you uh, for having me today. Um, I'm a school board director uh, working on year 14. Uh, William Penn Dis School District started this case in 2014. We really have no choice. But as I've listened and screamed at the screen over this court case at Mr. Grill, who I just don't understand, this is a civil rights court case, right? Like this is about the rights of students. Hi, Adrian. This is uh, Ed Brown calling from Upper Darby. Um, and their right to an education. Now we know these students can learn. We know they come from less finances and we know what we can do to help them. And clearly, given the McDonald's education track, um, they're not interested. Um, they don't, if you listen to this testimony and, and where the state side is going, they believe if we have one student that achieves in speech and debate, I think was the, we uh, won the humorous section of speech and debate because you learned to laugh at William Penn. Um, if we win that, then we're okay. It doesn't, the other children don't matter. Um, they are being defined by their parents' finances right from the beginning. Now, this happens in public education. It also happens in public health. We're just not taking care of our most vulnerable. Um, and that's not okay. And my district, uh, you cannot underestimate uh, how badly we need to win this. Um, as Dr. B. Coates, our current superintendent said yesterday, in 2024, uh, COVID money will run out and we will be back to a $400,000 fund balance. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable that these children are not treated like every other child. Um, it's all just not acceptable. It's pretty deplorable um, that we would do this to children and we would define them before uh, they reach adulthood. They're getting defined and that's not okay. So thanks for having me. <clears throat> I look forward to a Thank day you, when Jennifer. we don't have to have these conversations um, and that all children in the state of Pennsylvania are treated fairly. Thank you. And you've been on the front lines with this for a long time. So we thank you for your service on the school board. Um, I, up uh, next, we have. I love my families. I love my communities. There's no question. Thank you. Um, so up next, we have Angie Hinton. Um, the, and well, I'll let you introduce yourself, Angie. Thank you. Um, my name is Angelique Hinton, and I'm the president of the Norristown NAACP. And I'm also the executive director of PA UFO. Um, but in addition to that, I'm also the mother of three children who attended the Norristown Area School District in Montgomery County, which has been tragically underfunded for a long time. So I've seen firsthand how harmful it is to have a student attend a school um, where no matter how hard the teachers and the administrators might try, um, there's just never enough resources to meet the needs of the students. When my son 
was in eighth grade and he started to kind of get in a little bit of trouble. Um, I asked the teacher why, you know, he didn't have any homework. Um, and I was told because they didn't have enough books to send home. So how can that ever be acceptable? It can't, right? Um, kids in our district don't have access to the same educational resources. Um, they often don't have access to after school programs. Um, and when it comes time to apply for colleges or jobs, they aren't as prepared as students um, in wealthier districts. And, you know, they struggle to compete. This often negatively impacts the trajectory of their careers um, and earning potential and can harm them and their families um, for years to come financially, um, possibly even for the rest of their lives. So not only is this wrong, um, this is an issue um, that is racially discriminatory um, because these inadequate and equitable school funding is deport, it's de disproportionately impacting um, schools predominantly attended by black and brown students at a much higher rate. So all across the Commonwealth, there are little black and brown children who are being denied adequate access to a quality education and an equal opportunity to achieve their dreams and realize their goals. So as the president of the Norristown NAACP, I support this uh, school funding lawsuit because it is, as earlier said, a civil rights issue. I believe there is no greater equalizer for a child than equal access to a quality education. So we must all use every tool available um, to hold our legislator accountable to adequately and equitably funding public education for every single child, no matter where they live and no matter the color of their skin. Thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, Angelique. Thank you very much. Um, up next, we have our seventh grade teacher. And as I told her students, Mrs. Mead's students, one of the best teachers in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So Holly Mead, you are up. Hi, um, my name is Holly Mead. We are in Scranton, Pennsylvania, Northeast Intermediate School. That's six, uh, I'm sorry, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. These are my seventh graders. Give a big hi. Okay, um, they are super awesome and they're excited to be here. And we've been talking about that and using some of the lesson plans that we created over the summer to explain everything to them. And um, our biggest part in Scranton for our students is we realize that the funding affects these people. And that's really why we wanted them to be here today because that's who this is all about. It's all about these students in this school in Scranton. And whatever schools that your children are in or whatever schools that you're advocating for, all of those students need those dollars. Um, recently, we have a new science teacher and she started this year and she's like, where are the microscopes? And I said, oh, I think you have to get those from the other science teacher. And so between the two of them, they share four microscopes. So that's just one example of ways that underfunding affects these students right behind me. Um, we have talked in our class about supplies and things they need. We just had a conversation about it while you guys were talking about things that we needed and they would like to have their library open. They would like to have after school programs. They would like to have more of a language choice than just Spanish. They would like to have gym more than once just every six days. They would like to have more related arts in their cycle except for one a day. So they have tons of things to say um, I wasn't going to bring this up, but at the end, so if we can't get into the trial, you might be able to ask one or two of them might want to share a question or share some what funding means to them. Because I think when you hear it from the mouth of babes, it carries a lot more weight than adults sometimes. So I love these kids. They're awesome. I'm super excited. And I'm hoping that we can bring more money to every school district in Scranton. And none of these kids or any of my students are on that McDonald's track, just so you know. Okay, you guys wanna say anything? How about, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Okay, all right, bye. Great, thank you for being here. And I, I hope, I think the trial is actually um, gonna be starting late. So let's hope that we can have, hear from some students before we uh, sign off here today. And so um, our next speaker is Jackie Huff, who is a school board member in State College Area School District. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Huff, and I'm one of the newer members of the State College Area School Board in uh, Center County. Last night, our board signed a fair funding resolution to support the legislative action being taken against the state. 
And right before the vote, I had my proudest moment yet as a board member when our student liaison who was sitting on the board meeting stood up and said, the students are really glad that you guys are considering this resolution. Many people in the state know that education funding is inadequate and inequitable. But generally those of us in districts who are lucky enough to have a uh, property tax base to draw from don't have to bear witness to how inequitable it is. This case has forced us to bear witness to these facts and we are not going to turn away, even if it is uncomfortable and infuriating. Our students and our board, we all want to live in a Pennsylvania where all students receive a thorough and adequate, <laughs> a thorough and efficient education. We've come together to end the perpetual inequities that plague our educational system that have worked to narrow and limit the futures of many students, especially students of color. We will not look, we will not back down and we will not give up. We will work until all students are granted the education they are worthy of because every student is worthy. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Awesome. And so everybody, everybody on here, there's information um, about the school funding resolution in the chat, and we will send it up to you um, in the email, but it was pretty extraordinary to get the State College Area School District to pass that last night. So thank you, Jackie. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Tamia. Hi, everyone. I'm Tamia Scipio-Smith. I'm the Education Policy Director at Children First. Thank you all so much for being here and for advocating for education. And a big thanks to the students who are here because I want you to know that we are all fighting for you and we believe that you should have the highest quality education available. Um, in addition to our speakers, we have a number of supporters who are also here. There are many lawmakers who uh, support the education funding lawsuit and who are fighting to make sure that you have that thorough and efficient education that we talk so much about. There are also school board members that are here from uh, the school district of Philadelphia, which is currently the, the uh, school district that's testifying today um, to say that students need more. So I'll give a shout out to uh, school board president Joyce Wilkerson and school board vice president Lati Ajia Hinton, as well as school board member Mallory Fix Lopez and school board member Lisa Sally. Also Upper Darby school board president Ed Brown is here. Um, and I know a number of other education supporters, uh, so just a former Secretary of Education, Jerry Zavorchek, was also on. So I know that if you are a person who's worked for school boards, who have worked for schools, if there are any other teachers or any other supporters who are here, I want to hear you give a shout out for education so that we can hear your support. I'll you know, follow Amy's lead and say, get off of mute for one second and give a holler and a cheer for education. Woohoo! Ah, yes, a holler and a cheer for education and for our students. And I want to hear the biggest shout out for all of you for taking time out of your schedule to show how much you care about education funding in Pennsylvania. So give a shout out to yourselves. Yay! Yay! All right. Well, thanks so much. With that, I'll turn the program over to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Karen Downer. I'm Karen Downer. I'm the president of the NAACP Bucks County. Our branch is inclusive of the entire county of Bucks with a particular focus on our school district. NAACP State Conference is a, a named petitioner in the lawsuit and we are of course supporters. So greetings from NAACP Bucks County. There are 500 school districts in the state of Pennsylvania. What a jolt to know that 277 districts, districts that include urban, suburban and rural areas of this state need over $2,000 in additional funding to support their students' learning needs and to graduate them prepared to compete in our economy. From the day of the inception of the NAACP in 1909, we understood that education was critical to our future. 
every black student deserves access to great teaching, equitable resources, and a safe learning environment from grade school classrooms to college campuses. Black students matter and working on their behalf has never been more, more urgent. Today, 71% of children experiencing poverty are children of color. Our education systems are collapsing under inequity and it's mostly because of poverty. Students who experience severe economic obstacles perform worse than students who have access to more wealth. I am from Bucks County. I, I, I'm, I am in the lower Bucks County area. I have been to school districts in Upper Bucks and was amazed at the beautiful buildings, large classrooms, wonderful libraries, stadiums, gyms, and auditoriums. I knew there was a difference between Upper and Lower Bucks and that Upper Bucks has a higher tax base. However, you would be shocked to know that of the 13 school districts in Bucks County, only three are funded at capacity. In Bucks County, school funding ranges from $30,144 per student in the New Hope Solberry School District to $14,613 per student in Bristol Borough. The greatest funding disparities, disparity shortfalls are Bristol Borough, $5,182. Bristol Township, $4,397. Morrisville Borough, $3,183. And Ben Salem Township at $2,669. These are the school districts with the highest percentage of minorities in the county, but with the greatest gaps in academic outcomes in math, science, reading, and standardized test scores our legislators created the disparities, and then they blamed the students for not being able to overcome these obstacles. To bridge these gaps and ensure that all children get a real chance at, at a fulfilling education, we need to address systemic racism and poverty as tangible barriers to learning and future achievement. And we want the court to direct the state to create and maintain a constitutional school funding system that enables all students to receive the resources they need to meet Pennsylvania's state standards. Thank you. Will I announce our next speaker, Susan Knoll? Hi everybody, my name is Susan Noel. Good afternoon. I am the parent of a seventh grader. I'm so happy that you all are here. You all rock um, in the school district of Lancaster. I'm also a social worker by trade and I'm a firm supporter of public education. I believe in particular in the potential of public education to serve as a bedrock in a, for a multiracial democracy. Sadly, there are two systems of education in our country, and especially in Pennsylvania, one that serves children who are economically disadvantaged, and most of whom are white, and one for disadvantaged children, many of whom are Black and Latino. In many ways, the way that we fund our public education system is operating exactly as it was designed to to allow children of the powerful and affluent myriad opportunities while limiting opportunities for the children in school districts like my own. This two-tiered system has accurately been described as educational apartheid. Not only does it harm millions of children, but it also has a negative impact on all of us. When children in our communities are not allowed to, the opportunity to flourish, we all suffer. Currently, my state senator, Scott Martin, chair of the Senate Education Committee, and many of his GOP colleagues are willfully and unlawfully denying the right of an adequate education to children who reside in low wealth areas of our state. Their proposed solution to this injustice is to expand funding for private schools via the ruse of opportunity scholarships, which allow certain children the opportunity to opt out of systemically neglected schools. These children, most of whom research shows come from economically advantaged families living in under-resourced districts are afforded the opportunity to attend private schools or well-funded public schools in the suburbs at the expense of other children in their districts. 
No family should have to cross their fingers that they will be deemed worthy enough to have the opportunity to access a well-funded education. For every child who is lucky enough to be able to award, be awarded such access, there are about 28 students left behind, children who are just as worthy as any other to explore their potential and learn in a safe and adequate environment. This is not only bad policymaking, it is unjust and it is immoral. Should the decision of this lawsuit favor the petitioners, it will be the first step in holding our elected leaders accountable for upholding such an unfair system. And it will be an acknowledgement that all children are worthy of our state's investment in their and our future. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Okay, up next, we have Philip Daniels from Norristown. Thank you, Tamia. Um, first, uh, it, it's an honor to be here with everybody who's so committed to, the, to this issue and seeing this through. I'm especially honored to be here with uh, Angelie Kenton um, from the Norristown area school, from the Norristown area, and Monica Dan, Dr. Monica D'Antonio, my VP, uh, so Phil Daniels, president of the Norristown Area School Board. Let me just start by giving you a number, $15 million annually. That's the current estimate for what Norristown Area School District is owed every year under what ought to be a thorough and efficient state funding mechanism. $15 million every year. It's educational apartheid. In all of the proceedings and the political drama surrounding fair funding, it's easy to lose sight of what those dollars mean to districts like ours. We have higher special needs than the state average, so it would mean a thorough and efficient level of paraprofessional and special education support. With the longer term impacts of COVID coming to the fore, it would mean a thorough and efficient team of mental health professionals to support kids who are even more at risk now than they were before COVID. With $15 million, we could hire 80 to 90 additional teachers annually. That's how big the gap is today. Our student teacher ratio should be much closer to those in other districts. And that's just the programming, support and curriculum delivery. We haven't even addressed infrastructure yet. Our neighboring districts are both building brand new and very impressive schools, while NASD is replacing the original cafeteria in the high school from 1972. Do you wanna know how old that is? Look at me, I was two years old when that cafeteria was built. The retroactive dollars that are owed to our district conservatively run past $90 million over the past six or seven years. This is a civil rights issue, no doubt. It, and finally, just let me say that it's not complicated. Every child in this Commonwealth deserves the same quality of education, no matter their zip code, full stop. Fix this now, show me the money. Thank you, Phil. Um, Laura? Hi, everyone. Um, it's so great to be here with you all. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to add my, my voice to what's already been shared. I'm a parent and a school board member in Pottstown School District in Montgomery County, as well as a co-founder of Pennsylvanians for Fair Funding. For years, I've been able to spend a pretty significant amount of time volunteering in our district, working in the classroom, and as a student mentor. Let me just tell you, our students have both interest and aptitude for a whole variety of subjects, from science to English, from the arts to math, and every subject in between. Pottstown students are creative, thoughtful, and collaborative. They are full of potential, potential that needs to be encouraged and nurtured and supported with resources. This support is especially critical for at-risk students. For example, I was working with one bright young woman who has some significant life challenges. She told me she would like to be a midwife or, her, or perhaps an OBGYN. And I earnestly believe that she is capable of reaching that dream if she has solid resources and strong school support. Unfortunately, resources for our more vulnerable Pennsylvania students are in short supply due to the lack of fair funding from the state. 
That's why I was so angry and still am and dismayed as well to hear the lawyer for Senator Corman argue that we really shouldn't be concerned when students in under-resourced districts lack proficiency in core academic areas like biology and algebra one. It's as if many in the legislature have justified underfunding districts with high numbers of poor students and students of color with the idea that they are just destined for jobs where they supposedly don't need a full education. This is foolish on so many levels. The most obvious being that the legislature and their lawyers, all knowing though they seem to think they are, don't know which students are best suited for which careers. But even more importantly, it misses the foundational goal of education. Education isn't only about preparing a young person for the workforce. It's about preparing them for our world. Education opens a young person's eyes to the gifts that they have to bring to the table, unlocking potential that may otherwise remain undeveloped. When students receive the full and well-rounded education they deserve, they graduate not only college or career ready, but prepared to make their way as citizens, neighbors, parents, and leaders. In Pottstown, we say it this way, our district mission is to prepare each student by name for success at every level. Our world and our commonwealth need the gifts that each student can bring. Uh, not only not at all to be a cog in the wheel of the workforce, but to be healthy, thriving members at every level of, so of society. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> And now I want to acknowledge uh, other folks that have joined on or who are here supporting education as well. Um, I see that Representative Briggs is on. So thank you for signing up and being here and supporting education, um, as well as a number of other school uh, board presidents and school board uh, members. So let me acknowledge them as well. Uh, school board president Yanni from Scranton as well as school directors Fox, Gil Martin, Clearly, and Holmes, uh, <clears throat> Norristown School Board member Chris Jaramillo, as well as PARS, the Pennsylvania Association of Rural Schools President Ed Albert. So thank you for all being very committed and uh, jumping on and supporting education. We appreciate all that you do. And with that, I will turn this program Amy, to get more in the spirit of yelling and supporting public education. Woo! What an amazing, amazing, powerful group of speakers we had today. I hope all of you are feeling a little inspired and a little outraged because that's what's going to take to make this better for all of our kids. So I saw on the chat Everybody was very excited with a particular chant, which was, show us the money. So how about you unmute yourselves and let's do a little show us the money to keep our energy going. Ready? Show, show us, us the money. Show us the money. Show us the money. Show us the money. Show us the money. I love how they were leading us in this chant. Love your energy. Love that you're going to be leading us into the future. So super glad you're here. Um, I get the joy of introducing our next speaker, wonderful, wonderful Sandra Miller, who has been working on um, organizing all of you folks to be involved in this court case. And she is going to give us some insights into what's been happening, what's coming up next, and what we can all do to get involved. So Sandra, we've been showing you the money. So now show us the court case. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, just you know, wanted to thank everybody for coming and all the support. Um, I'm the advocacy coordinator for Education Voters PA, and I've been working with Ed Voters and Children's First, um, setting up app opportunities for us to watch the trial. Um, unfortunately for us today, um, the trial went long. So the trial isn't in session for us to be able to do that. But I would just give you a little bit of background. So far, who we've had testify, we've had the six, um, we have six school districts that are petitioners in the lawsuit. And we've had um, 
as well as some parents from the school district of Philadelphia, William Penn, Wilkes-Barre, and Greater Johnstown. So far, we've also had expert witnesses that outlined the history of funding in PA, and they've outlined the adequacy shortfalls through researchers. And we've also had some really good information about how important early childhood education is. Um, today, we actually are having the opportunity, um, if you want to log in, we will make sure you have the link, uh, Dr. Height from the School District of Philadelphia is testifying. He went long into um, the 12 o'clock hour. So we are going to go right now um, to speak to Sharon Ward. Sharon Ward is a representative of the Education Law Center and we are so pleased that she took time out today to come and join us. Sharon, can you join us please? Sure, happy to do so. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Sandra, and thanks everybody. And we're so glad to see you here today. So my purpose is to give you a little bit of an, uh, an overview, an update of the trial, where we're going, where we've been and where we're going. So let me start by saying that we are entering the third month of the school funding trial. Think about that. We've been this, at this for two solid months and we are going strong and we're gonna go until the end. Um, I want to start by really giving a shout out uh, and actually asking all of you to give a shout out to the tremendous lawyers who have been uh, making this case in court from the Education Law Center, from the Public Interest Law Center, and from our pro bono attorneys, so Melvany and Myers. I have to tell you, for these two months, they have been living in a hotel, they've been away from their families, they're literally working seven days a week fighting for Pennsylvania students. So can we get a little bit of a thumbs up, shout out, yay, to our attorneys. I know that they're really going to be grateful, they are working so hard on this trial. So since November, we have heard from, from five of the six petitioner school districts, and we've heard from PARS, the Association of Rural and Small Schools, who's been a great partner. And actually, this is their second time um, as petitioners in the school funding case. We've lost the first one, but they have come back, and we're really grateful to, that, for, uh, to them for that. Uh, the leadership of all of these organizations is amazing because they've had the foresight and the courage to challenge the most powerful people in the state, the governor, the House and Senate leadership. Um, I can tell you this is no small feat. It's a risk to all of them and we appreciate their willingness to do that. But they have all demonstrated that, you know, they have the courage that it takes to um, help us to put an end to this school funding system that has really shortchanged kids in our urban and our rural districts. We are grateful to them and to all the petitioners who have participated in this trial. And a special shout out to all of the witnesses. If you've watched the trial, you realize that many of our superintendents, our teachers, um, our expert witnesses have sat there for days, hours and days of grueling testimony, including such things as going through the entire course catalog in the Panther Valley School District, or going through every staff person in the William Penn School District. It almost seems as though there's an effort to wear down the people who are working so hard in their day jobs um, and um, you know who have been forced out to be there and do such a wonderful job. But I think what's really important is that the trial has sort of provided a window into our schools and really has allowed us to see the tremendous juggling acts that the leaders of the schools of poor school districts, in fact, all of our school districts, but particularly our poor school districts have had to engage in and the really impossible choices that they have had to make. So you're gonna hear this if you haven't heard it already, but the respondents, the other side in, the, in this trial, is going to say that this case is about envy, that really all school districts want and parents want and students want is Olympic sized schools and, pro and professional grade football fields. But if you've watched any of this trial, you realize that the truth is so much different. We are struggling for basics. We've learned that there aren't enough bathrooms for elementary schools in Panther Valley and Johnstown, and that their students have to learn in closets. 
We've learned that kids in sports programs in the William Penn School District, sports programs that research shows really aid students engagement in school. They can't host the visiting teams because of the condition of their fields. And we've learned, and I think this is probably the biggest takeaway for, for all of us watching this trial, that years of underfunding, years of budget cuts a decade ago have meant that schools pretty much have stopped repairing their buildings. So we've learned also that student populations have changed and that students' needs have grown. Lancaster has 500 refugee students to educate and its English learner population has grown substantially. So these children need to be given a chance to achieve their dreams and our current funding system doesn't do that. And if you listen to Dr. Height testify this morning, you've learned about the sheer size of the problem in Philadelphia and the challenges that they have there in providing enough resources for students. They have more than 2,000 students in foster care. They have more than 2,000 students experiencing homelessness. There are 22,000 students with disabilities in Philadelphia, which is more students than in our next largest school district. We also learned from expert witness Derek Black that the people who put the thorough and efficient clause in the state constitution didn't trust the politicians to fund their schools. And they told them that they had to spend a million dollars, a huge amount of money in those days by putting it in the constitution. So I guess really what we've learned through this trial so far is that, that some things never change. So we've learned from Professor Matt Kelly that based on the state's own calculations, we're underfunded by at least 4.6 billion. And we've learned that economically disadvantaged students, black and Latinx students perform better when they go to higher wealth, better funded school districts. We know that the only shame is that we have to go to court to prove it to our elected leaders. So I think the biggest takeaway from the trial is that educators understand what students need and with the right resources, every child can succeed. You know, back in the day, President George Bush had a program, no child left behind. And perhaps our elected leaders in Harrisburg should set that as their goal and not, uh, don't go to algebra, just flip a pizza. So here's what you can expect. The law, the law centers will rest their case in the next few weeks, but that does not mean that the trial is over at all. We can expect the lawyers for the legislature to fight us tooth and nail for a number of weeks. We need you to pay attention. We need you to be vigilant. We need you to speak out when they disrespect our students, denigrate our teachers, and don't care about our schools. We don't know how the judge will rule, and it's very likely that there'll be, a, be an appeal in any case. But so far, the trial has really opened people's eyes to the inequities in our school funding system, that urban and rural school districts have many of the same challenges, and, and most importantly at all, that things have to change. Thanks. Thank you, Sharon. That was a really, really great recap. And so um, because we can't go to watch the trial right now, and I see a lot of things in the chat from students in Scranton, I wonder if there are some students in Scranton who would like to make some comments or if you have questions that you'd like to ask, I will let Mrs. Mead kind of take the lead on that for the next, I don't know, five or six minutes. Does that sound good? That sounds great. I had some of them type, um... We had talked about this before and I had them type in the chat the things that they would like if they had fair funding. So I'm just gonna ask them um, if we were fairly funded, what would they like and let them expand. So I'll just call on a couple people. I'm gonna mute myself so it doesn't like get a little crazy here. Okay, let me call on a couple kids to answer some questions, okay? All right, who wants to, Erin, you wanna go? Okay, so this is Erin. Introduce yourself, Erin. Tell them your name, your grade, and tell them what you would like and why. Um, hi, I'm Erin. I'm in se seventh grade, and uh, I think that we should have like more specials in the day. So, like, it's just instead of having like 
a bunch of class periods. They're having like music one day. They're having to wait to have music. And the next week we could just have like two specials in a day since our class periods are so long. So we could like shorten them and then we could have that. And then we wouldn't have to wait since in our school, we have one, we have one special a day. Then like that special, you have to wait for like a whole another week until we have that special. So then, so we could just have like two or three specials in a day and then like maybe two or three days. So then we can have that special again. That's all. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, who would like to go next? Geneva? Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Geneva Tawana and I'm in seventh grade. And um, I think we um, should have more related arts, basically saying what Aaron has said, but um, specifically talking about languages, like language classes. And I think we should have more language classes because we should have the option to um, pick what language we want to learn about and like wanna um, speak. And so I think we should have more language. So then um, we get the option to pick which one we want to talk about. Oh, um, right now we only have Spanish, but it's like, a, it's just, it's a related art. It's not an actual class. It's basically, it goes with like gym and art and music. So like we have to, it's like, we didn't get to pick it. We just had to like, they just gave us Spanish and we only have it once a week. So it would be nice if it was like an actual class and um, we had more options. I believe our school should have a theater of, um, <laughs> I believe our school should have a theater program. Many other schools, many other schools have a theater program, but I feel it is unfair that we do not. Theater is a great way for one to express themselves and have fun. Many of the programs are in Scranton cost high amount of money and many cannot afford it. Therefore, I feel that a theater program in the Scranton school district would be a great improvement to our schools. Hi, my name is Julie, and I think we should definitely have a library back. Because, well, actually, it wasn't my idea. It was actually my class six ago. And since he's not participating, I will actually, if he wanted to participate, I'm just helping him. Um, so I think the library is an awesome idea because definitely it would be great to go there to relax, uh, catch up on work, study, read books. And I think it would be great for everyone because, I mean, my, myself, I like making time. Hi, my name is Kalia Clark and I'm in the library. I believe that with the funding that we would get, we should, the teachers deserve more supplies and new projectors to the classrooms because a lot of the times teachers have to buy their own supplies for the classrooms and I don't believe that's fair. And the new projectors would help a lot with our learning um, because most of the time they don't work and it would be better for our learning. Hi, I'm Annalise Manley. I'm in seventh grade and I think the, the special ed teachers should get more supplies. Um, 
for an example, Ms. Shaw, which is our family consumer science teacher, she has to buy her own supplies. And I don't think that's very fair to her. Um, and I think that we should have all three of the, like the activities in one grade each. She had to split them because there wasn't enough supplies for each grade. And I think that each grade should get to do um, sewing, financial stuff, and cooking all in one a year instead of three separate years when they're in middle school. Uh, we can't cook because um, the school cannot afford all the supplies to, to cook for all three grades or all four now. Um, but since they cannot afford them, um, they had to split them into three. So sixth grade does financial. Us seventh graders do, do um, what's it called, sewing. And eighth graders do cooking. And I think it'd be fair if all three of all three grade got to do all three at one year. I feel like we deserve more funding because it would be great to have a bigger basketball gym so we can actually play basketball games inside our own gym instead of having to use a different school's ones. Uh, I also feel like it'd be great for more funding so we can have more after school activities so after school can be funner for more students. Okay, is that it for our seventh graders, Holly and Mrs. Mead, that's, or are there more? Are we that's it for our seventh graders, but I just want to say that um, we have a couple basketball players in here, and they can't even play in our home gym because it's too small, and we have to go to a different school, so we would like that too. Um, and thank you so much, and I just uh, appreciate everybody that was here today and all these kids, and I think when you hear it from them, it says so much more. So thank you. Bye. Thank you. I mean, I think I know that I am like going to even double down further and harder on working on this issue because it is, you know, I mean, not all of us get to see um, actual real students. And so you are our inspiration today. So thank you for doing this. And I have to say, I'm very impressed with your public speaking skills and with your writing skills. So great job to Mrs. Mead and all of the teachers that you had leading up to seventh grade. Scranton looks like it must be a really great school district. So. Um, all right, so we're going to sign off here in a minute, but I think that what we need to do now is not just go feel rage, but actually go take action. So we will send out an email to you after this with links, but in um, of, of a couple of simple things that you can do. The first thing is um, we set up a little really easy letter that you can send to your lawmakers telling them that you support the school funding lawsuit. Depending on who your lawmaker is, you'll either get back a very good and sympathetic, yes, I, I agree with you response, or you will get back very likely a very lame, um, upsetting response from your lawmaker who says, I've already funded schools. I vote for increases in funding every single year. We're doing everything great. So um, I think it's a really good way for all of us to engage with our lawmakers, to let them know we're watching the trial and to get them to make, say something kind of back to a constituent about how they feel they are funding our schools. So in the chat, I put that link, but you can also, we'll send it to you in the email. The other thing that would be wonderful is if you would be willing to um, ask your school board to pass a resolution in support of the school funding lawsuit. So we probably have 15 or 20 school districts where this has happened. It's, a, it's really easy. Um, I have a, it's all set up. Um, I can mail you handouts. I can mail you information. Um, we can mail you comments. So whatever you need, we can provide to you. Um, this happened in the Huntington School District. and. Um, you know, I think we have a, a reporter from Huntington who's uh, uh, joined us today. It is a really important way to be able to share with your community what is happening with the school funding lawsuit and chances are very good that you are in a school district that is, is missing out on funding. A lot of times um, school boards are going to start to go into budget season and they're going to have to make really difficult choices. They're going to have to make cuts or they're going to have to raise taxes. And the reason they're making cuts and raising taxes is because our state lawmakers have not provided our districts with adequate funding. And local people who get mad at school boards need to take all that anger and they need to direct it to our lawmakers who need to fix the system because our school board directors can't fix this on their own. They have to take the funding they have and they have to do the best they can with it. And a lot of times the choices they have to make hurt kids. So we will ask you if you would ask your school board to pass the resolution. And then um, we and voters and 
uh, uh, Children First are on Twitter. We are following the trial and we were live tweeting this. So if you are on Twitter, it was really a really super easy way for you to be engaged is to just watch the, the tw Twitter feeds and, and just retweet. And then that will help show that show your network um, you know, what's going on in the trial and help engage more people. And also um, following the law centers on Twitter. And again, the, the best place you can go for all of this information is just www.fundourschoolspa.org. That is where you can watch the trial every day. All of us should just get up in the morning, click on the trial and have it running on the back in our, on our computers in the background. Um, you know, you can tune in and tune out, but if we have it on, then we, then we can see what's going on. And then you can find daily recaps at Thunder Schools PA that's been put together by the law centers. So it's like your one-stop shopping source for everything lawsuit related. So those are the things you can do. You'll get an email from us probably tomorrow morning. Uh, I am delighted that everyone has been here. So thank you for being with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mia, to Tamia for us to, um, to sign us all off. All right, thank you, Susan. I'm so enthusiastic to have you all here today. It's amazing that you took time out of your day to support our st students and such an amazing uh, experience for our students to be here so that we do not forget who we are fighting for. So just a reminder, it's the year 2022. 75 kindergartners are sharing one toilet in Panther Valley. 1,200 students have two reading specialists in Greater Johnstown. 10,000 plus students are served by zero math interventionists in Lancaster. 15 minute recesses are all some five-year-olds have because there are no staff to supervise longer in William Penn. And in Philadelphia, there is one counselor for 799 students and countless buildings in need of repair and remediation. Does that sound like a thorough or efficient education to you? It isn't. <clears throat> Not in Panther Valley, Greater Johnstown, Lancaster, William Penn, Philadelphia, or in any of the school districts across the state that are struggling to meet students' needs. There is no McDonald's career track. There are students. Pennsylvania students are students. When the state supports the needs of some students, nurtures their potential and invests in them like they will become the state's employers, CEOs and leaders, but ask the educators of other students, what use would someone on the McDonald's career track have for Algebra One? Then there is something gravely wrong in how we perceive education and who has the right to be educated thoroughly and efficiently a constitutional wrong that must be made right. Our students deserve that. The Constitution promises them that. Ensuring that our students have adequate and equitable funding and providing them all with the resources they need to succeed is clearly the right thing to do. And it's the smart thing to do because our students will leave school, join the workforce, and will continue to shape our economy. Every year, Pennsylvania's retirement age population grows by 61,000 people. The Commonwealth's working age population, ages 25 to 64, is expected to decline every year to at least 2030, according to the National Association of Workforce Boards. With access to a thorough and efficient education, our students will become the skilled workforce that our state's employers are seeking. That's just not limited to some students. All of our students have that potential. It is imperative that we invest in all of them like they do. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to our speakers from across the state for supporting our students. Thank you for joining us and for your active support of this historic trial for the thorough and efficient education funding. We stay on uh, well, if the lawsuit uh, back on, if not, we encourage you to tune in uh, every day, fundourschoolspa.org, and encourage others to do the same. May I please add a point? Okay, let's see. Who was that speaking? Stephen it, Hefner. Okay. Hi. Uh, has anyone from the group been following or mindful 
of the fund students not systems movement that's brewing and of a young gentleman by the name of Corey DeAngelis who is yep. a and, yep. and, and so in kind of in, in kind of separate efforts outside of the school funding lawsuit I think our organizations do push really hard back against the whole school privatization issue that Susan Knoll referred to which is like kind of the alternate idea of educating kids where you like find pri you basically privatize public education and kind of do, and do things like that so I think out, outside of this effort education voters and, and children first both do focus on that but I think that today we wanted to just stay focused on on this issue so I would love to talk to you more about that um, I'm going to put my email in the chat and then I'd love to just kind of share more efforts outside of the lawsuit with you about that. Does that sound good? Yes, because um, I, I don't know that I would classify the characterization as you spoke of it there as um, what the movement is representing. Okay, yep. So I would love to have that conversation kind of like outside of this event um, at another time. So I put my email in the chat and I would love to talk to you. So thank you very okay. much. And, and thank you to everybody who came today. Um, I hope everybody has a great, great rest of your day. Um, and we look forward to working together because we are building a movement. And you guys are all part of it. So thank yes. you. Yes, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. If you do want to know, the trial is just starting. The judge just arrived back in. So please go to fundourschoolspa.org and click on the trial. I'm going to share my screen as you all leave and so you can see what it looks like. Um, thanks for coming. Make sure to stop recording. Okay, PX0478. Andrea, stop recording. The GJMS safety report letter. I thought you were co-hosting, Haley. Can you do that? I can't do both I, of the screen. I up. cannot actually, because oh, it's on I, your computer. Sorry about that. No <laughs> worries. I will stop recording. Don't, yeah, no one needs to.